Hello and welcome to Okawa Book Club. We're your hosts. I'm Hannah. I'm John. And in today's podcast, we will be deep diving into chapter two of The Challenge of Enlightenment, Ryuho Okawa's latest comprehensive Buddhist title, Freeing Yourself from Ignorance. The main theme we'll be exploring today is how to identify our daily problems by applying some of the basic teachings of Buddhism. We suffer in life because we don't know what is causing our suffering due to ignorance of the truth and more specifically, ignorance of spiritual truth. Yes, the word ignorance is often used in Buddhism to mean spiritual darkness or lack of wisdom, which means that without knowing the spiritual truth or spiritual wisdom, we are blind and left in the dark, clueless as to how to solve problems in our daily life. So today we're going to do things a little bit differently. We felt that because this theme is so important and it's very precise and goes in stages that we would read sections from the book itself rather than trying to put in our own words in a way that won't be quite as clear. So the first section we'll read from is section one of the chapter, the cause of suffering in life. The word ignorance is often used in Buddhism to mean spiritual darkness. It is a state in which there is no light. It is as if you are groping your way on a trackless path or walking in the mountains in the middle of the night. You do not know when you might trip on or bump into something or when something might come flying at you. Everything that you touch ignites fear in you. In a sense, ignorance can also mean a lack of wisdom. In fact, it is ignorance that causes most of your suffering or worries in life. It is because you are living without the light of wisdom that you suffer or worry about many things, and as you get caught up in them, you often sink into the depths of despair. So it is necessary to examine what kinds of things derive from a state of ignorance. This is a theme that encompasses all the teachings of Buddhism, so I will not go into a detailed analysis of it, but the classical thinking of Buddhism would say the three poisons of the mind. There are three types of poisons that toxify your mind. The three poisons are greed, anger, and foolishness. The first is greed or excessive desire. The second is anger, which might also include hatred. The third is foolishness or folly. Buddhism says that the three poisons of the mind delude people and lead them astray. This refers to not only renunciant disciples, but also lay disciples. These three poisons are the causes of delusion. In this chapter, Master Okawa talks about the three poisons of the mind greed, anger, and foolishness, and the five poisons of the mind, which are adding pride and doubt to the initial three poisons of the mind. These poisons of the mind are the causes for us to make wrong choices and creates anxiety and unhappiness in our lives. But we want to mention that traditionally there are actually six poisons of the mind, greed, anger, foolishness, pride, doubt, and wrong views. But this chapter in particular deals with only five of them. So let us look at each poison of the mind one by one. From page 67, the first poison is greed. And it states, in short, greed is love that takes. The opposite of greed, using the terminology of happy science, is love that gives. In other words, it is an attitude of offering or selfless giving. The teaching of offering in Buddhism is a teaching that recommends people to abandon greed. The nature of greed can easily be understood if you observe other people, but it is usually difficult for us to see greed in ourselves. It is quite hard to see whether your own desires or wishes are more than what you deserve, but it is very obvious to see that in another person. Therefore, you need to make an effort to see yourself objectively by observing other people closely. That's an interesting point. It's like we can never know when we're being greedy. That's difficult. (laughs) Definitely need to have more perspective on ourselves. So the second poison is anger. And this is on page 68. Anger, the second poison, means the tendency to fly off into a rage. It is the anger that you cannot control. Some people are short-tempered and quickly fly into a rage. They lose their temper and do not know what they are saying. Instead of thinking calmly to themselves, this is something I must express my anger about, they become furious the moment they see or hear something that they deem offensive. This is anger. Anger has been considered one of the poisons of the mind through the ages. When this feeling arises, the calm surface of the mind becomes disturbed. 
Consequently, you feel uncomfortable and irritated, and you cannot sleep at night. As a result, you cannot enjoy the company of others and fall into the habit of getting angry easily. There are people who appear to be clever, look good, and are highly competent at work, but are not promoted as quickly as they expect. These people typically have a quick temper, because this type of person may lose his temper or demonstrate a sudden change of character at a crucial moment in business. He loses the chance to succeed just before the finish line. So even if someone suggests that he be promoted to a managerial position, the executives might say, we cannot trust him because he is quick-tempered. What if he starts quarreling with our clients? He sometimes lashes out at his subordinates, or sometimes he goes against his boss. Because of these sorts of remarks, the promotion is put off. Therefore, if a person doesn't get promoted despite being highly capable, it is most likely because they are short-tempered. Anger is an animal instinct. When animals feel threatened, they soon growl, show their claws, or bristle their fur. A porcupine, for instance, raises its quills when it encounters an enemy. A human's anger may be similar. It may be instinctive self-defense, an instinct to protect one's territory from invaders. But if you are able to control your anger, your mind will always be calm and serene. This is the most appropriate state to take on spiritual discipline. There is, however, an exception to this anger. Up until here, I warned you about personal anger, but there is another kind of anger that can be justified. It is the indignation about social injustice. This is not something that should be dismissed entirely. Without this indignation, society cannot improve. So, with the consideration that the two exceptions to anger are indignation and admonishing, I'll read the following passage from page 70. While it is important to keep personal, instinctive anger under control, you need some level of public anger or rational indignation. Without this, society would never evolve. Many of the religious reformations we have seen throughout history were led by those who stood up thinking that the religion at that time could no longer save the people. This occurred as a result of not personal anger, but the energy of rational indignation. So please don't misunderstand this point. Another exception is admonishing others to educate them. This type of admonishment is different from personal anger or hate. When you see someone doing something wrong, it is not right to let him do it. If a child is doing something mischievous, the father or mother must scold the child so that he will be able to correct his wrongs. Otherwise, the child will grow up not knowing how to control himself. So scolding those who are still immature to give severe instructions is different from personal anger. These are the two exceptions to anger as a poison of the mind. Yeah, I just want to mention something about the admonishing anger. I think it's a very uh, difficult one. And one time someone gave me advice. He said that think about your intent when you're angry. It's like, do you want to hurt that person out of revenge? Or do you actually want to educate them with love? And I think when you have that separate, you can, if it's the first one, you can try to just nip it and stop take a breath and walk away but the second one you really have to your words will change if you realize that you're doing it out of love i think you will say the right thing hmm. but it's very difficult <laughs> it's very difficult yeah. but you think that when this case like how did someone get angry at you but how do you get angry at someone right it was something i really thought about in this chapter yeah yeah i think there can often be a lot of mixed feelings about that and guilt sometimes when we're angry at people we care about and mm -hmm. and i think it's good to that this like gives you a sense of clarity mm -hmm. of the what the higher truth of the matter is yeah. you know to sort of inform our own emotional compass yeah and in, but in today's climate everyone is so sensitive mm -hmm. that if yeah. you're trying to do this admonishing anger they either quit or they're like you are you know, you reject my entirety, <laughs> you know, like you're <laughs> right. disrespecting me. Right. They'll call you racist. <laughs> you know, they'll do it. They'll throw everything out there. So we really need to chill out. And when you're being scolded, think about it also. Yeah. You know, they might be doing it out of love, actually. Yeah. And most likely. And I think a lot of those people might have a, an ignorant 
take on indignation also, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which causes them to feel angry about healthy admonishment. Yeah. <laughs> the third poison is foolishness. And from page 71, we read, The third poison of the mind is foolishness or folly. Part of the Japanese kanji character for foolishness symbolizes illness and means ignorance. I believe you all can relate to that in some way. It could be said that everyone is foolish in some sense, unless you are truly enlightened or truly a Buddha. Human beings are imperfect and often make mistakes. However, although you are far from perfect, it is important that you do not become so foolish as to let go of your reason. We often hear stories of people who had moved to the city from the countryside and were taken in by swindlers who claimed to have found an easy way of earning money. Also, religious people are said to be naive and credulous. Because of their sympathy, they tend to be easily taken in. You must always be aware of this kind of foolishness. The fourth poison is pride. This will be on page 73. And it states, I have just described the three poisons of the mind, which have been famous since long ago. But if you are advancing on the path to enlightenment, there are two other poisons you need to be very careful of. They are pride and doubt. Pride here means conceit or arrogance, and it usually arises from ignorance. There are several kinds of pride, but here I would like to refer to the two main types of pride that seekers of enlightenment need to be most careful about. The first is the desire to boast about something you have done. When you succeed in something, you want to show others it was you who did it, or your ability that made it possible. Although in reality you received help from many others. People easily overlook how much they owe others. It may be true that you have made tremendous efforts to achieve success and that you have sufficient ability to deserve it. So it may be natural for you to want to boast, but this is wrong in the light of truth. Pride comes from success or achievement, which in itself is a justifiable reason. But pride should be controlled precisely because it prevents you from making further progress. The opposite of pride is modesty, and without modesty, you cannot make further efforts. Excessive pride obstructs you from practicing right effort of the Eightfold Path. There is another similar type of pride called conceit, In particular, when a person undergoing self-discipline attains quite a high level of enlightenment, he tends to become conceited. Since ancient times, this has been a common tendency among spiritual practitioners and is also difficult to avoid. Naturally, when people begin to experience a highly advanced state of mind, they begin to feel confident. If they think they are already enlightened, they tend to be blind to their own mistakes and immaturity. In other words, they become incapable of reflecting on themselves. They criticize and denounce others, and before they know it, they become lost in a jungle and can no longer understand where they are on the path to enlightenment. The fifth poison is doubt. And from page 78, we read, In addition to the four poisons of greed, anger, foolishness, and pride, there is doubt, the fifth poison of the mind. In modern society, having questions or doubts is often considered good because a scientific or journalistic approach begins by asking questions, which leads to answers. Modern philosophy has also attached much importance to the exploration or pursuit of questions and the analytical observation of things. So questioning everything is generally considered reasonable. However, here we have a major problem in relation to the world of faith. Religion is, after all, all about believing. To have faith is to believe in what is invisible. The mind and soul are invisible. God and Buddha are invisible. The light of the great universe is also invisible. We cannot see love with our eyes, nor can we see mercy. All of these things belong to the world of the unseen, and believing in them gives humans nobility. In contrast to animals, human beings can have faith, which gives rise to human dignity. From page 79. Although it is important to have the mindset of exploring the questions you may have, It should not be done in a way that would make you lose the most important thing. If your mind is always filled with doubt or suspicion, you can never be serene or calm inside. It is impossible to live with a peaceful mind. If you always doubt others, you will never be able to find peace of mind. It is true that people may attempt to trap or cheat you, but while keeping in mind that such things do happen, generally speaking, it is important to believe in other people. 
The five poisons of the mind are different manifestations of ignorance. I advise you to take fact as fact and gain knowledge, examining yourself deeply so you can free yourself of these poisons. Such a good point. The five poisons are different manifestations of ignorance. So bottom line, ignorance is a huge problem. So in conclusion, most of life's problems are rooted in ignorance. It is important to learn the teachings of the truth to free yourself from ignorance. It is not enough to learn the truth only through reading. You also need to understand it deeply through experience. This means that you must develop the ability to solve the various problems you encounter in the course of your life. Otherwise, knowledge of the truth will not turn into true wisdom. However, there are many people who can score full marks simply on paper. You can acquire knowledge if you have a good enough memory and sufficient time, but the key is how much knowledge you are able to apply to everyday life in terms of your actual experience. Unless you can master this, you cannot truly free yourself from ignorance. I hope this chapter will help you solve your own problems by yourself. So at the end of today's podcast, we would like to briefly mention a little bit about Chapter 3, The Four Noble Truths, which explains how to find the root cause of suffering and our problems, and how to remove or resolve them by entering into the Eightfold Path. This process is very similar to how a doctor diagnoses an illness and prescribes treatment. Also in this chapter, you can find the difference between Shakyamuni Buddha's original traditional teachings and the teachings of happy science, which are based on Buddha's original teachings but surpass the teachings that Shakyamuni Buddha taught. From page 105 and 106. At happy science, I have already taught many philosophies of this type. For example, there is positive thinking, the attitude of trying to focus on the bright side in every situation in life. And there is invincible thinking, the attitude of learning lessons from both good and bad things. Advanced thinking is another teaching that urges you to re-examine your way of life from the standpoint of the real world so as to be able to spiritually raise yourself to the highest possible level. Beyond the teachings of the Eightfold Path are other such positive and affirmative thinking philosophies which allow you to beat back the suffering in life and achieve greater happiness. Whereas it took some decades for Shakyamuni Buddha to reach the stage of the philosophy of positivity, happy science was more inclined to the philosophy of success from the beginning. We have quickly surpassed the early stage and are at a more positive phase. First was the denial of this earthly world and a worldly way of life, followed by a shift to affirming this world and a life in this world. This is a change in perspective from the standpoint of the weak to that of the strong. It is also a transition to an attitude for actively generating positivity in this world. The focus of our teachings is on these sorts of powerful thoughts. It is often said in the mass media that as a religious group, happy science does not seem to be very concerned with ordinary problems such as poverty, illness, and conflicts. But our approach signifies that we are already at the next stage of teachings. We started our activities at the level of Shakyamuni Buddha's later years and are now continuing to move on to a higher level. This is our standpoint. Please understand well this difference between Shakyamuni's order and happy science. There is no need to repeat the same thing twice. Using the work that was done before as a stepping stone, we are building a higher structure. This is the natural course of events. I have explained the Four Noble Truths in relation to the teachings of happy science. I hope you understand this well. So this chapter really goes into step-by-step -step methods of how to get rid of your ignorance and is really worth meditating on and really deeply contemplating. The answer is here. If you want to stop suffering, please read and contemplate on this chapter. So that is it for today. Thank you so much for listening. The Challenge of Enlightenment is available at major bookstores such as Barnes & Noble and Amazon.com. And we'll be back next time to discuss the topic of egolessness. Thank you.